Well, greetings, church family of the Gladstone Christian Fellowship. Um, whenever you're watching this, whether it be Sunday morning or afternoon or evening or whenever, I greet you with the blessings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just before I get to my message, I just want to give a couple of announcements of, uh, that our church family should know about. Uh, one is that uh, Ann Edwards, uh, our dear sister, who's been fellowshipping with us for probably about 15 years or so, is going to be moving to Steinbeck uh, very shortly if she hasn't already. And uh, so probably it would be great to let her know uh, that uh, we've appreciated her, her company, her presence with us over the last number of years and uh, to continue to keep in contact with her. Another couple that will soon be leaving us is Dustin and Sarah Penner and their three little kids. And so we uh, wish them God's blessing in their new pursuits uh, down in Southern Ontario. And uh, for the rest of the church family, this is uh, an opportunity to, uh, to say farewell to Dustin and Sarah before they uh, head out in, in the not too distant future. And just one more reminder, it's kind of a somber reminder um, that uh, Bill and Shelley Unger have uh, said farewell to uh, Shelley's brother George. George attended here for some time. Uh, George passed away quite suddenly a little over a week ago and so uh, I would encourage us all to be in prayer for, for Bill and Shelley. And in regard to another somber reminder that's been just over a year uh, since Bobby Joe and Jennifer Lindsay and their little daughter Kinza, Kinza died in a in a house fire and uh, so we should be praying for their remaining children uh, who are living with uh, Keevan and Carolyn Holt and uh, Cindy Halsmans. So uh, just, a, just a reminder for, for prayer for these folks and, and to uh, remember these folks who are moving from our midst to, to somewhere else. Okay, I'm going to start off with a question. How many of you kids, as kids, heard your mom say the phrase, how many times do I have to tell you? And then she would go on to say, close the door behind you or wash your hands and face before you come to the table or go to bed on time so you won't be tired in the morning or take a smaller helping at first and then if you're still hungry you can have seconds. Probably those phrases and many others were repeated by your mom or your dad or some other caregiver over and over as you were growing up. And as kids, we often needed reminders of some things that we had already been told, things that we already knew but just forgot about. Other times, we didn't comply with our parents' desires or commands just because we didn't comprehend or understand their instructions. I remember hearing of my niece as a young uh, girl. Uh, she'd gone over to her grandma's. Her grandparents lived on the same farmyard as, as her parents did. And so she was often over at her grandmother's uh, visiting and uh, her grandmother would often give her a cookie. And sometimes two cookies. And uh, <clears throat> one time uh, her grandmother gave her a cookie while she was there and then just about as she was about to leave she says, oh. And here's another cookie for the road. Well, uh, this young girl, I think she was four or five years old, as uh, she walked back to her home and crossed the road, the main uh, laneway, she threw the cookie down on the road. And her mom saw this and wondered, why are you throwing a good cookie down on the road? And she says, I don't know, Grandma told me it was for the road. And so she was obeying her grandmother's instructions, but it wasn't what her grandma meant. <clears throat> 
she misunderstood her instructions. Sometimes we thought that what our parents were asking of us was difficult. It was too hard. It would take years for us to do. It was too long. Or it was too boring. No fun at all. And so we kind of delayed our obedience in hopes that our parents would change their minds about the assigned task. Well, in some ways, the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians was very similar to his first. It seems like he had to repeat some of the topics of his, of his first letter. And part of this letter is clearing up one other misunderstanding about the second coming of Christ. Uh, this misunderstanding was different than the one Paul addressed in his first letter to these young believers. Uh, this letter is similar to the first. It was meant to be an encouragement to a young and persecuted body of believers. But it was also meant to be a correction in belief or doctrine and a correction in lifestyle. <clears throat> Bible scholars place this letter some months after his first letter and probably within the year of his first letter. And scholars believe that he wrote both letters while he was in the city of Corinth when on his second missionary journey uh, together with uh, Silas and Timothy. Paul's co-worker Dr. Luke tells us in the book of Acts that Paul ministered at Corinth for a year and six months uh, during that time. Now the distance between Corinth and Thessalonica is 576 kilometers. Those two cities are still very much active cities today. And uh, if you drove it by highway, it would take you over six hours nonstop. Walking it would take 115 hours nonstop, and depending on the weather and how many hours a day a person was willing to walk would determine how many days it would take. But my guess is that it would take a minimum of 10 days, probably more, but at least 10 days. So letter communication back and forth between the two cities was possible. It would just take a lot of effort and time. Anyway, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> had gotten word somehow of how the church at Thessalonica was doing. Now, this is some time after he wrote his first letter to them that we now call First Thessalonians. And in response to what he's heard, the news that he's heard some way, somehow, he writes this second letter and sends it to the young believers at Thessalonica. This letter, this second letter, can be divided into four sections between Paul's opening greeting and blessing and his closing benediction. The first section is uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 12, could be described as thanksgiving and comfort for the persecuted believers of Thessalonica. The second section is actually the whole of chapter 2, and it's refuting false beliefs about the day of the Lord or when the Lord will return. And he goes into uh, uh, detail in describing what we would refer to as the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 are a request for prayer, a kind of a transition before he deals with the problem of idlers or deadbeats. That's the fourth section in chapter 3, verses 6 to 15. And the Apostle Paul starts this letter with a familiar greeting to this group of believers, chapter 1, verse 1, of asking of God's blessing of grace and peace for them. Grace is the undeserved, unmerited favor of God, and peace is the quiet confidence of knowing that God loves them and he cares for them and knows all of what they are going through, and that in God's own perfect time, he will accomplish his purpose. So before I, I continue any further, I think it's appropriate that we just take some time and read through uh, first, uh, Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. Let's read together. If you have your Bibles, don't have your Bibles with you, you can pause it and go get your Bible and come back and read together with me. Reading from the New, the New American Standard Bible. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, 
as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and for the work of, the, of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So far, the reading of God's word. That first section of chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, is thanksgiving for the Thessalonians. Paul says it's appropriate or fitting for us to give thanks to God for these people. Why? Well, because they'd grown in their faith. They'd actually grown very quickly in their faith. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ had changed their lives. They were living out their faith. And one evidence of that was the love that they had for their brothers and sisters in Christ. And that love was growing all the time. What a wonderful commendation. Someone had to have come to Corinth from Thessalonica and given Paul, Silas, and Timothy a report, a report of how the Thessalonian believers were doing. And by the sound of Paul's commendation, they were doing pretty good, despite the ongoing persecution that they had been facing. Their faith was growing. Their love for fellow believers was growing. They were persevering despite ongoing afflictions for their faith in Jesus. And Paul was holding them up as an example for other believers to follow. He was speaking proudly of them among the churches and the believers at Corinth, where Paul was, knew about these faithful believers up there at Thessalonica. This leads me to a, a principle that I think we need to be, be remembering, and that is it is appropriate, appropriate to celebrate and to share God's working in the lives of believers with others. You see, as believers, we can all learn from good examples of God's people living out their faith and their love and their perseverance. And it's encouraging to see and hear how God is changing the lives of other believers. It reminds us that God can work in our lives, shaping our character so that we become more and more in line with the character of Jesus, who is our ultimate example. But we can learn from how God is working in the lives of other people. We can look, oh, wow, if, they can, if God can do that with them, he can do that with me too. The next five verses, verses 5 to 9, ser were to serve as an encouragement to the Thessalonians in regard to their afflictions and their persecutors. But these truths should also serve as a warning to those who oppose the message of the gospel of Christ and also as a warning to those who ignore the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that these new believers are persevering in following Christ despite opposition, you know, it costs them something to follow Christ. It costs them relationships. It costs them status in their community. For some of them, it cost them financially. In Acts 17, we have the record of Jason and other believers there at Thessalonica who had to pay money out of their own pocket just to keep uh, the governors happy or, uh, as kind of a bond. At times, it cost them 
their physical well-being, their, their physical well-being was threatened. If we look back at Acts, we remember that Paul and Silas were rushed out of Thessalonica by night by the young believers there because they were afraid that they were going to get killed, that Paul and Silas would get killed by those hostile towards the gospel. But the fact is that despite this opposition, these believers still faithfully were following Jesus. And that is a sign that there was something supernatural to this. And Paul describes it as an indication of God's righteous judgment. The persecution that these believers are enduring is adding to their heavenly reward that's going to last for all eternity. This persecution is refining them. They are focusing on the eternal instead of merely the temporary. These persecutions made them long for the return of Christ. You know, despite these persecutions, we find that them being faithful, even in the difficult times, was God's way of turning what human beings meant for evil into something that he uses to accomplish good. This was being good for the Thessalonian believers. They were storing up rewards in heaven for their faithfulness despite opposition and dif difficulty. You know, God often does that. He turns what people mean for evil, and that doesn't mean he needs people to do evil so he can turn it into good. But God in his sovereignty can use what people mean for evil and turn it into something for the good of others for his glory. Take, for instance, the patriarch Joseph, one of Jacob's 12 sons, hated by his 10 older brothers, or most of them anyway. He was going to be killed, but they thought, no, let's make some money on him uh, because he's dad's favorite. Let's get rid of him. He's an annoyance to us. And so they sold him into slavery, never thinking that they would ever see him again. And yet God, in his sovereignty, used Joseph to spare many nations from famine, but he also used Joseph to bring Jacob and his other sons to Egypt where he was pre they were preserved and protected for over 400 years. And Joseph says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to save many people alive. What a great God we have. A God who can turn satanically empowered attacks on his people to do something eternally good for his people. You know, Jesus' words come to mind when thinking about this. In his Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Another aspect of encouragement for the believer is the truth that those who are doing the persecuting will face God's judgment for their actions if they do not repent. Those who continue in rebellion in the gospel, to the gospel of Christ will receive their judgment, but those who uh, will receive their judgment, but those who continue on in rebellion and in persecuting God's people will receive a greater judgment. For believers in Christ, the return of Christ is something to look forward to, to hope for. But for those who do not know God, the return of Christ is something to dread, especially the second part of the day of the Lord. We read Revelation chapter 6 that during the tribulation period, unbelieving people of this world, whether they be people of high position or low position or no position, will desire to be crushed by a landslide from a mountain rather than face the wrath of Jesus, the Lamb of God. We read that in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 17. 
And obviously their belief is that being buried beneath thousands of tons of rock and dirt will kill them and they will escape God's judgment. But that is not the case as we see from many passages throughout the whole New Testament. And I firmly believe that this time, this is the time that Paul is describing is from the rapture of the church, which he describes in his first letter of, to the Thessalonians in chapter 4, which will usher in the beginning of God's judgment against the ungodly people of this world. The whole period of time from the rapture until the day of the great white throne judgment is properly described as the day of the Lord, the time of Christ's return. And during the time of tribulation, God will bring his judgment against the people of this world. There will be wave after wave of judgment, three waves of judgment, each having seven, dip, seven different flicks upon the earth. And what we see as we read through, we see there are two responses to this judgment of God. And the one response that we see, in, especially in Revelation chapter 16, is the continual rebellion and blasphemy against God. People per curse God for pouring out his judgment upon them. And under the influence of Satan and his puppet of a world leader, the Antichrist or the beast, people will continue to defy God no matter how terrible things get for them down here on this earth. That period of time will make the terrible wars and plagues of the past look like a nice walk on the park on a sunny day. People, if, if, if they're people who have lived through the pandemic of, of COVID-19 are in the tribulation period, they'll look back and think of this time of however long it takes of this pandemic as a pretty good time. It'll be a walk in the park compared to what goes on during that great tribulation. But the encouraging thing about this is that God will still save some out of that great tribulation. In chapter 6, 7, and 15 of Revelation, we find, especially in chapter 7, we find that a great multitude of people will be saved, some of the, a vast majority that nobody can count, uh, will be saved even during that tribulation period. But we find out a vast majority of them will give their lives for the decision to surrender to Christ. They will lose their lives, but their eternal destiny is to be with their Savior. Well, the Apostle Paul reassures the Thessalonian believers that those who do not come to faith in the only Savior God has provided and repent from their sin against him will experience God's judgment. And Paul describes it as eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, there in verse 9. On the day of the Lord's return, Jesus will be marveled at by his children. It will be a wonderful time. It will be a glorious time for God's people. It will be the beginning of eternity with Christ. It will be the fulfillment, the glorification of our salvation. In verses 11 to 12, Paul closes this part of his letter by describing to these believers at Thessalonica how he is continuing to pray for them. And the first part that he asked God for, the first thing that he asked God for, for these believers, is that God would count them worthy of their calling. The New Living Translation translates it as asking God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. You know, that's a prayer that we as believers today can confidently pray for one another, for each other, asking God to enable our fellow believers to live a life worthy of his call. We can pray that for ourselves as well. And part of living a life that is worthy of God's calling for us to be his children 
is fulfilling every desire for goodness and the work that our faith in Christ beckons us to do. You see, often we as God's children have a desire to do good in the name of Christ. We have a desire to step out in faith and do something that will matter for all eternity. But very often we feel inept. And so we let that feeling of stepping out in faith, of wanting to do good, we let that pass us by. Or we have a different thought that, well, that's great, and when I'm not so busy with these other important things, then I will do this or that in serving the Lord. I think we need to all understand that first of us, first of all, all of us as believers are inept in and of ourselves. We can't do anything that will matter for eternity in our own physical strength or our own mental ability or our own financial ability, whatever. But empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, we can do whatever the Lord asks us to. Whatever the Lord lays on our heart to do to further his kingdom, to do good, to proclaim his gospel, to encourage his followers, to help the needy, whatever it is, God can empower us to do what would naturally scare us to death. And God can empower us to do the things that he saved us to do. If we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we know that we're saved by grace. It's not of our works that no man can boast. We can never earn our salvation or get God to like us more by, by uh, doing you know, good works for him. But we read in verse 10 of chapter 2 of Ephesians that God, when he saved us, he prepared a whole lot of things for us to do. He saved us not only to take us to heaven, he saved us to do good things for him while we're down here on this earth. He's prepared them for us to do. You know, what a tragedy to experience God's salvation, but only to have faith enough to do a small fraction of what he saved us for. The reason Paul the Apostle Paul is asking for all of these things for the Thessalonian believers, we read in verse 12, is so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in the lives of these people who were so dear to Paul. So that these believers also would be glorified in their Savior, experiencing God's eternal rewards is the believer's glorification. Hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master, is the child of God's glorification. And that glorification of God's children can only happen because of God's grace. We read that also in verse 12. According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we won't get fat heads in heaven because of our glory. We're not going to be running around and saying, look at me. I'm glorified now because of I did this and this. We will be well aware that our glory in Christ Jesus is because of God's grace, his unmerited favor toward us. I'm not sure about you, but these truths, as I read them and dwell upon them, encourage me today, and I hope they do for you as well. But you know, also besides encourage me, they challenge me because they remind me of the need to care for people enough to let them know that they need a savior. That they need a savior. How much do we care for unsaved family members or unsaved friends, people that 
we know who are our friends, but they're outside of God's family and they need the Lord. May it just be a reminder of the reality of where people will spend eternity and how God has chosen his children to relate the good news of Jesus Christ to everybody they're in contact with. May we uh, strive to be his servants by his power and because of his grace as we represent him in this fallen world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this letter that you inspired Paul to write, this second letter that reminds us of some basic truths that we sometimes put on the back burner and forget. And so Heavenly Father, help us to remember that uh, many, many people are headed for destruction because of their attitude towards the only Savior that they will ever have. Because they don't think they need Jesus. Some don't even know that uh, they can put their faith in Jesus. They don't know who Jesus is. But Lord, help us to do what we can, what you've called us for, what you've saved us for, to demonstrate your truth before a needy world, to care about them enough to let them know they need a Savior. Well, Father, we need your power to do this. We trust that you'll give it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just going to give a benediction now from the book of Thessalonians. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. Comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Thank you for listening. May God bless you this Sunday, this celebration of our Lord's resurrection.